Now, let me recap what they just said there. We get these great big gas and dust clouds out there called nebula, and they rotate around and around and around, and they are doing that. And as they rotate around and around and around, they begin to gravitationally collapse inward due to the rotation there, and that is true. But what they're not telling you is the rest of the story, and the rest of the story, folks, is called science, not belief system. See, as this cloud condenses in on itself, it generates something called heat pressure. And this is something we can measure. You can go to a Physics 101 book and see this information. As that cloud begins to collapse inward, it generates heat pressure. And that heat pressure is stronger than that gravity and will always cause that cloud to expand outward. You see, we're not teaching science anymore. What we're teaching is evolution in our classes. Once again, creationists are portraying scientists as complete idiots. In this instance, Mike Riddle is implying that every single astronomer in the last 100 years that has worked on star formation doesn't have the slightest understanding of, quote, Physics 101. Supposedly, astronomers are completely ignorant of the fact that when you compress the gas, its temperature and pressure increase, causing the gas to re-expand. Presumably, if astronomers were aware of this elementary fact, then they would surely realize that if a gas cloud in space is contracting due to gravity, the very act of compressing the cloud will cause its temperature and pressure to increase, resulting in the cloud re-expanding to its original size. I have already explained what's wrong with this statement in Episode 7, but I feel compelled to go into more detail about why the temperature of gas clouds in interstellar space doesn't increase when they contract under the influence of their own gravity. The basic idea is deceptively simple. If an object is hotter than its environment, then heat will flow from the object to the environment until the temperature drops to the temperature of the environment. Imagine that we have a cylinder of air with a movable top that we can move up and down to change the volume of the gas. We also suppose that initially the temperature of the air in the cylinder is the same as the temperature of the air in the room that this gas cylinder is in. Now we push the top of the gas cylinder down to compress the gas in the cylinder and not surprisingly this causes the temperature of the gas in the cylinder to increase. But now the gas in the cylinder is at a higher temperature than the gas in the room. So heat will flow from the gas in the cylinder to the gas in the room until they both have the same temperature. The same thing happens to a cloud of gas and dust in interstellar space. If a cloud is massive enough, then it will begin to contract under the influence of its own gravity. Effectively, gravity is compressing the gas, so the temperature of the gas will increase. But now the temperature of the cloud is higher than its surroundings, so heat will flow from the gas cloud into space, causing the temperature of the cloud to decrease. Thus, the pressure that would have been present to support the cloud against gravity if the temperature of the cloud had increased will not be present and the cloud can continue to contract. In practice, the rate at which the cloud radiates heat is equal to the rate at which heat is generated by gravitational contraction. So the temperature of the cloud will not change as it contracts. Hence, by ignoring the fact that heat flows from hot objects to cold objects, Mike Riddle has come to an incorrect conclusion about what happens when clouds of gas and dust begin to contract due to their own gravity. I want to go into more detail about the actual mechanism by which interstellar clouds of gas and dust lose heat. We first need to understand some basic features of gases. A gas is a collection of widely separated atoms and molecules that are all moving at random speeds and in random directions. The atoms in the gas frequently collide with other atoms in the gas. In between collisions, the atoms travel in straight lines at constant speed, and therefore constant kinetic energy. During collisions, the direction, speed, and kinetic energy of the colliding atoms changes. The three most important properties of a gas are its density, temperature, and pressure. The density is just the number of atoms per unit volume, or the mass per unit volume. The temperature has to do with speeds and kinetic energies of the gas atoms. While all of the atoms in a gas are essentially moving at a different speed, and thus possess a different kinetic energy, the speeds and kinetic energies are not completely random. At a given temperature, there is a definite numerical answer to the question, what fraction of atoms in the gas have kinetic energy between E1 and E2, for any E1 and E2? If we know the mass of an individual atom in the gas, we can also ask the question, what fraction of atoms in the gas have speeds between V1 and V2, for any V1 and V2? 
It is often useful just to know the average kinetic energy and speed of a gas particle. The average kinetic energy of a gas particle is proportional to the temperature. That means that if you double the temperature, you double the average kinetic energy of a gas particle. In contrast, the average speed of a gas particle is proportional to the square root of the temperature. So to double the average speed of a gas atom, you would have to increase the temperature by a factor of four. The third and last important property of a gas is pressure. If you put an object in the gas, the atoms in the gas will collide with and bounce off of the surface of the object. During each collision, the atoms will exert a force on the object perpendicular to the surface. The force per unit area on the object is called the pressure. For an ideal gas, the pressure equals the number of atoms per unit volume times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature of the gas. So we see that pressure increases linearly with number density and temperature. Pressure increases with number density because the higher the number density, the more atoms there are to collide with the surface of the object, and more collisions mean more force exerted per unit area. Pressure increases with temperature because the higher the temperature, the faster the particles are moving on average, and thus the greater the force per collision. Two things are worth noting about pressure. First, pressure is defined at every point in the gas regardless of whether or not an object is embedded in the gas. The pressure is simply the force per unit area that would be exerted by atoms in the gas colliding with the object if you were to put an object in the gas. Second, pressure in and of itself does not lead to a net force. For example, imagine putting a cube in a gas in which the pressure of the gas is the same everywhere. Then the force due to pressure on one side of the cube will cancel the force due to pressure on the opposite side. This is because the forces will have the same magnitude but opposite directions. On the other hand, if the gas pressure increased from left to right, then the force due to pressure on the right side of the cube would be greater than the force due to pressure on the left side. Thus, there would be a net force on the cube acting from right to left. We use the term pressure gradient to describe a change in pressure with location. It is pressure gradients that lead to net forces, not pressure itself. Note that even if there was no object in the gas, a pressure gradient would result in a net force on the gas itself forcing it to flow from high pressure regions to low pressure regions until the pressure was the same everywhere. However, it turns out that pressure gradients are not themselves a sufficient condition for a net force. For example, the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere decreases rapidly with height. Why doesn't the associated pressure gradient drive the Earth's atmosphere into space? Well, because at every point in the Earth's atmosphere, the upward pressure gradient force is exactly balanced by the downward force of gravity exerted by the Earth. A situation in which pressure gradients balance gravity is called hydrostatic equilibrium. Hydrostatic equilibrium is ubiquitous in astronomy. It is what keeps stars stable as well as planetary atmospheres and interstellar clouds of gas and dust. There is an important distinction to be made between planetary atmospheres and stars slash interstellar gas clouds. In planetary atmospheres, the gravitational force needed to balance gravity comes from the huge mass of the solid part of the planet. The gravitational field from the atmosphere itself is negligible. On the other hand, the gravitational field in a star or interstellar gas cloud comes from the gas itself, so we use the term self-gravity to refer to the gravitational field generated by these objects. In order for an interstellar gas cloud that is initially in hydrostatic equilibrium to shrink into a star, something must happen to cause the gravitational force in the cloud to become stronger than the pressure gradient force, and this force imbalance must be maintained until the cloud has contracted to the size of a star. To understand how this happens, we must take a closer look at the structure of the individual atoms that make up a gas. Like all atoms, the atoms in the gas consist of negatively charged electrons orbiting a positively charged nucleus. Since the electrons are moving, they possess kinetic energy, and they also have potential energy associated with the electrostatic forces between an electron and the other electrons in the atom, and between each electron and the nucleus. We call the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of the components of an atom the internal energy of the atom. This energy is in addition to the kinetic energy associated with the motion of an atom as a whole through space, which we call translational kinetic energy. The internal energy of a given atom can only take certain discrete values. We say that the internal energy of an atom is quantized and call the allowed values of energy the energy levels of the atom. The actual values of the energy levels depends on the number of protons and electrons in the atom. The level with the lowest energy is called the ground state, and all of the other levels are called excited states. There are five ways that an atom can change the energy level that it's in. To make this discussion more concrete and less abstract, let's imagine an atom in a level with internal energy E1. There is another level with energy E2, 
where E2 is greater than E1. There are two ways that the atom can change levels from level 1 to level 2. First, it can absorb a photon with energy E2 minus E1. That is, it can absorb a photon whose energy is equal to the difference in energy between level 2 and level 1. Recall that photons are the particles that light is made of, and that a photon with energy E corresponds to an electromagnetic wave with wavelength lambda equals hc over e, where h is Planck's constant and c is the speed of light. Second, an atom can transition from level 1 to level 2 by colliding with another atom. During the collision, an amount of translational kinetic energy equal to E2 minus E1 present in the colliding atoms can be converted to internal energy of one of the atoms, allowing it to change from level 1 to level 2. When the atoms bounce apart after the collision, they will be moving slower than they were when they were moving before the collision since some of their translational kinetic energy was converted into internal energy during the collision. Now imagine that the atom is in level 2, which is the higher energy level. There are three ways that the atom can drop to level 1. First, it can emit a photon whose energy is equal to E2 minus E1. That is, it can emit a photon whose energy is equal to the energy difference between level 2 and level 1. Second, an atom can transition from level 2 to level 1 by colliding with another atom. During the collision, an amount of internal energy equal to E2 minus E1 that is present in one of the colliding atoms can be converted to translational kinetic energy, which is distributed amongst the two colliding atoms. When the atoms bounce apart after the collision, they will be moving faster than they were when they were moving before the collision, since some of their internal energy was converted into translational kinetic energy during the collision. Third, and finally, an atom in level 2 can transition to level 1 by absorbing a photon of energy E2 minus E1 and then emitting two identical photons, each of which has energy E2 minus E1. The fact that atoms have quantized internal energy levels and the manner in which they can transition between levels has profound consequences for the dynamics of a cloud of gas in interstellar space. It is exactly what is needed to remove thermal energy from an interstellar gas cloud so that its temperature can remain constant as gravity compresses the cloud. It works like this. The atoms in the gas collide with each other many times each second. During some fraction of these collisions, one of the colliding atoms converts some of the translational kinetic energy of the incoming atoms into internal energy, thus being promoted to a higher energy level. The atom in the higher energy level can drop to the ground state by emitting more and more photons. These photons then leave the gas cloud, carrying away energy as they do. Since the energy that each photon carries away from the cloud was once thermal energy in the cloud, and since temperature is proportional to the average thermal energy per atom in the cloud, the temperature of the gas drops a little each time a photon leaves the cloud. Or, if the cloud is contracting, then the photons can carry away thermal energy at the same rate it is being generated. So the temperature of the gas can remain constant as the gas is compressed. As long as the cloud can radiate away the heat generated by compression, the force of gravity in the cloud will be greater than the pressure gradient forces, and the collapse of an interstellar gas cloud can proceed until it becomes a star.